Hey everybody and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. So great to have you with me once again as we take a look at six more chapters from God's Word. we got six big chapters here and really incredible how these chapters kind of go together in many ways. Uh, what we have before us is 1 Samuel chapter 29 and 1 Samuel 30 uh, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in Ezekiel chapter 8, and then in Psalms, we'll take a look at Psalm 46 and 47. And since we've got uh, six chapters here, let's jump right in. Uh, first off, 1 Samuel 29 and 30. And what we have here, first off, is uh, in the beginning of 28, just verses 1 and 2, uh, we learn that David was uh, hired by Achish, the king of Gath of the Philistines, to go to war for the Philistines against Israel. And so even though the rest of that chapter left off with David and went over to Saul and what happened with the witch at Endor, now we come back to David at Aphek with uh, King uh, Achish. And Achish wants him to go into battle against Israel. But the Philistine commanders are like, no way, not happening. They don't trust David. Right, David is the one who has slain his ten thousands. That's ten thousands of the Philistines. He's gone, you know, against the Philistines again and again early on in uh, his military career, and they remember it. These commanders, they remember it. So they're like, "No, we are not going." This also affords David an opportunity to, you know, go back to Saul to turn on us and to make himself great in Israel. And so, militarily, it's a bad idea. And so uh, Achish doesn't want to do it, but he tells David that uh, he's got to go back to Ziklag, which is where, uh, this, it, that's the city that David and his men were given by Achish while they were making their various raids. So we come to 1 Samuel chapter 30, and David returns to Ziklag, and you can imagine them as they approach the city thinking, this is great, problem solved, we don't have to go and fight for the Philistines, and we don't have to fight against Israel. But as they approach the city, then they see that it's burned. Meanwhile, while they were out, Amalekite raiders had come through the area and attacked various cities, and in particular attacked Ziklag, burned it to the ground, took all of the stuff, the good stuff, and took all of the people captive, all the women, all the children that these men who had gone with David have left behind. So um, initially... There's just great sadness for David and his men. They weep, they wail. But then David, we learn, inquires of the Lord here. And um, and the Lord tells David to go and uh, fight against the Amalekites, that he'll give him victory and uh, all the lives will be spared. And so David goes out to, uh, you know, towards the direction of, of the Amalekites. And verse, I think it's verse 11 uh, just an, a powerful verse that there's just this Egyptian in an open field, uh, just out in the country that David's men find. And this Egyptian, after they, you know, he's close to death, so they give him some food and drink. And after they revive him, uh, he explains that he's a slave of the Amalekites and was actually present at Ziklag when they burned it to the ground and now currently knows where the Amalekites are camped. So this is just a fascinating gift of the providence of God here to David and his men. And uh, and the man shows David where the Amalekite raiders are. David and his men attack. They recover all of the women and children, all the people, every life had been spared. They require They recover all the spoil from the Amalekites. But then we learned that of David's 600 men, only 400 had gone to the battle. 200 had stayed back with the with their, you know, baggage and stuff uh, at the brook. And now 400 that had gone to fight, they don't want these 200 to have anything to do with it. Right? They say, you can have your women and children, but you don't get any of your things. And uh, But David here, recognizing it was the Lord who gave him victory, very clearly says, God gave us his victory, and so everyone's going to share in it. And David even goes and sends spoil to um, to some of his friends in Judah. 
amazing chapter. Just incredible, um, the, the providence of, of God showing up here. All right, let's move to New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And, um, you know, this chapter is not unrelated because here you have uh, Paul in the first half of this chapter making the point that um, the scriptures are, are were, were written, were given for the church here, God's people today, so that they would learn from what God has done in the past. He, he says that these things, uh, you know, happened as a warning to us that we would not crave evil things as they did. And he says in verse 11, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you're if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. And because in the context here in, in Corinthians, he's dealing with these people who had come out of idolatry. We don't think that idolatry is a risk anymore. I don't think that anybody's struggling with the temptation of idolatry. And says, be careful about mixing these worldly elements in as you follow Christ and pursue Christ. So he says, flee from the worship of idols. Right? Because, you know, if you, how can you uh, share in this idolatrous worship that goes on at these pagan temples. So he's really shifted gears here from focusing on giving up your rights in chapters 8 and 9 for the sake of your brother to just simply reconsider what is really best for you. You know, you say, I, I'm allowed to do anything in verse 23, but the reality is not everything is good for you. Not everything is beneficial. And, uh, and so ultimately the guideline here he gives in verse 31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's the question to ask. Can I do this for the glory of God? All right, let's move to Ezekiel chapter 8. And uh, and here the Spirit t- uh, takes Ezekiel to, uh, to the temple court and there's uh, just greater and greater sins. Like, you know, the, the Spirit you know, of the Lord shows Ezekiel you know, here, here's this the sin of idolatry, and he says, "Can you believe how you know how bad this is? Uh, this is detestable sins. They're committing. They're driving me from my temple." He says, "I'm going to show you something even more detestable." And he takes him to the door of the temple courtyard. He can see through a hole in the wall. He says, "Dig into the wall." So he dug into the wall and found a hidden doorway. Go in, he says. So I went in. The walls were covered with engravings of all kinds of crawling animals and detestable creatures. So they're worshiping idols here in the temple. Uh, Then he says, um, I'm going to show you even more detestable sins than these. Takes him to the north gate of the Lord's temple. And women are weeping for a false god, Tammuz. He says there's even worse to come. Takes him to the inner court of the Lord's temple. The entrance to the sanctuary between the entry room and the bronze altar. There's 25 men with their backs to the sanctuary of the Lord facing east, bowing low, worshiping the sun. He says, have you seen this? And then this is the point God makes. Is it nothing to the people of Judah that they commit these detestable sins, leading the whole nation into violence, thumbing their noses at me and provoking my anger? Therefore, I will respond in fury. I will neither pity nor spare them. And though they cry for mercy, I will not listen to so judgment. Is coming on them for the detestable sins. All right, uh, Psalm forty-six and forty-seven, and, and first off, Psalm forty-six, uh, and both you know just really great, encouraging, powerful psalms. God is our help and refuge, our refuge and strength in times of trouble. No matter what it is we face, even though the earth crumbles around us, though the earth quakes, still, God is our refuge and strength. Then he goes on here. He describes. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. Look at look at how God powerfully, providentially is God even over the wars in the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth, he says, verse 9. And then this word from the Lord, verse 10, be still. Shh. Stop. And know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Now, Psalm 47 here in closing is uh, just a simple psalm of praise. It's a beautiful psalm here. 
clap your hands, shout to God with joyful praise, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He's a great king of all the earth. He subdues the nations before us. Uh, he chose the promised land. God has ascended with a mighty shout. It just goes on. Sing praises to our God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. He is the king over all the earth. Praise him with psalms. He reigns above the nations. He sits on his holy throne. All the kings of the earth belong to God. He is highly honored everywhere. So praise the Lord for he is the one who rules and reigns. All right, that's all we have time for today. Uh, again, we had 1 Samuel 29 and 30, 1 Corinthians 10, Ezekiel 8, and Psalm 46 and 47. Thanks for being with me these last few minutes. I uh, hope you enjoy your time in the Lord's Word today and every day. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book. We'll see you again soon.